to Full Service Radio. Full Service Radio. Full Service. Full Service. Full Service. Full Service Radio. Hey everyone, it's Melissa and you're tuning in to the Edible Activist Podcast. This show highlights black and brown edible activists in the food and farming space. And no, not that kind of edible you're probably thinking about. We're talking about food activism, everyone, and stories that are taking us back to the land. As the creator of Food Talks DC, I travel the DC area and beyond to document personal food journeys, anecdotes, and perspectives from everyday people on topics related to health, tradition, environment, food justice, culture, and more. Every week, I will bring in a special guest to hear their personal food journey firsthand and learn how they are channeling edible activism in the DC area. We don't promote people, we tell stories and empower communities. Today on the show, I am so excited to have Shanna Tion and uh, Shanna and Fran- Francois Tion. I had to say them both. I have a couple. It's double trouble today, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and they have, and they're actually their platform is called the Black Suburban Homestead. And so we're going to learn about them today. And, and I'm really thrilled because I haven't met them before. And we follow each other on, on Instagram. And they have um, defined this whole way of living out in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is located in Montgomery County, a suburb right outside of the D.C. area for you guys who are not familiar. And I'm just really thrilled to learn about all of this and about them. So they're going to take us back to their journey a bit. You know how the show goes. Like we learn about their journey and then we kind of like trek along, trek along and, and um, to bring us to this place of, of this why, you know, and why this lifestyle and what, what's going on now and what they're defining for their future, for their family, for their tradition, their culture. And so welcome, guys. Thank, Thank you, you. Melissa. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to you. <laughs> Francois said good morning to me. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys today? We're good. I'm good. glad to be here. Happy to share and, and checking out the line. Hotel is my first time here. It's kind of funky. And so it's exciting, right? Yeah. Totally. Well, you know what? We're, we're going to talk about all your edible activism work, you know, because like I say, the movement is for everyone. It's about, you know, just changes and being conscious and just everyday things that people are doing in the food and farming space, whether it's intentional or not, um, for the community, for your family. And so I'm just excited to have this platform and bring you guys on. Thanks so, for having us. Absolutely. Um, so I want you guys to take me back. You all met in Cameroon, right? Actually, yeah. take me back before that. So Francois is from Cameroon. Yes, I'm from Cameroon. And Shana. Where are you from, actually? I don't know. Hampton, Virginia. That's right. I didn't know. Hampton. So, VA. Mm-hmm. So, were you always a country girl? No. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh-uh. Was <laughs> that wrong of me to assume <laughs> that? I mean, it's a natural sort of logical progression of thought. She's doing agricultural stuff now. Maybe mm-hmm. she grew up that way, but no. Okay. I am the the example of if I can do it, anybody can. I, I grew up in the suburbs, raised by a single mom. You know, in terms of outdoorsy life or living, that wasn't what I grew up with. Me and my friends went to the mall or a skating rink. We didn't, like, hike and do nature walks or or garden. So this is really the last maybe decade or so of my life that I've kind of come into this space. But no, not at all. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so how'd you get to Cameroon? Because you met your husband in Cameroon, but you had a Peace Corps opportunity. Well, sure. So that's how I got into... Um, I got to, to Cameroon through Peace Corps. So did undergrad at Florida A&M University. All right, go sure. Rattlers. Okay. And then I always knew. I don't know how I knew, but I always knew growing up there were two things I wanted. I wanted to do Peace Corps and a PhD. And I don't know how because I didn't have any examples. <laughs> Nobody was doing that. And I finished Florida A&M with a degree in engineering. And people were on the job market. And so I went to, I let Chase Manhattan fly me up there. But I knew I wanted to do the Peace Corps. Okay. So apply for the Peace Corps. Um, they let me select my country. It was between Martania or Cameroon. Went to Cameroon and was an agroforestry volunteer. But I did very little agriculture then. I was like, that's still not my thing. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And so I did more girls empowerment. Yeah. And it was helpful, but it wasn't what they expected me to do. And so... 
that's how I got to Cameroon through Peace Corps to do agroforestry work that I didn't really do. But you randomly just chose agroforestry because you're ma- you okay. So you're a tech girl. Is it is your engineer? Right. So I was a biological and agricultural mm. systems engineering major, but really light on the okay. ag. Okay. Excuse me. Go yeah. girl. Yeah. <laughs> light on the ag. Heavy on a whole lot of other stuff. Didn't qualify me to do anything agricultural, but have a title, right? And so. Um, that's what they, because Peace Corps looks for uh, what you have a skill set in to okay. send you to do something that you can be familiar or qualified to do. So they saw this degree and they thought, oh, she must know something. Joke was on them. I didn't, but <laughs> well, I you went got there. Yeah. <laughs> Ka-ching. Make it till you make it. <laughs> right. And so that's kind of how I, I ended up in agroforestry in Cameroon. Oh, wow. Okay. Francois, you're from Cameroon. Take us back. What was it like growing up in Cameroon, and how did you meet this lovely woman over here? Well, uh, mm-hmm. first uh, growing up in Cameroon, it uh, means a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it means uh, to be able to juggle as early as a teenager your student life, your uh, household chores, and uh, your 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 farmers' activities. Because I think you grow up in the Basically, in a rural area mm-hmm. and where most of people they are they are farms, so I grew up in that city, and I was able to juggle all these things that I just mentioned and um, it 's very challenging you are because uh, during the vacation or the school break times and holidays and weekends, you shift from being a student to being a, an assistant farmer so mm, right. an assistant farmer so um, I grew up in this type of environment, and that's how I really shaped my interest in um, farming or gardening, and um, also uh, develop the the taste or the love of nature. Mm-hmm. So that's exactly in that setting that I was brought up. And as far as um, uh, our encounter happened, <laughs> it, it was uh, later on when I went uh, after my, my studies at, at the university and and I also get, I was in, uh, involved in Peace Corps mm-hmm. that's, okay. that's oh. the intersection oh, that's the point okay. so I, I happened to after in fact actually it was um, sort of transition because of my real field as you, you may know I, I'm a sociologist and environmental sociologist precisely mm-hmm. I was uh, conducting research within uh, some NGO international NGOs and toward environment issues and um, after my contract ended and also because uh, I'm very interested in culture and language mm-hmm. I apply to Peace Cup and uh, that's how this, the, the story begin, begins so and, I and by the way everyone Francois's first language is French Thank you. <laughs> so and, and he's leaving it out too. He was actually my my language trainer in Peace Corps. So yeah, Francois. yeah. no. It, it didn't. Give us all the juicy, the juicy <laughs> details. It didn't happen. I think we remain very professional because I think everything is post Peace Corps, mm. so to say. Sure, I'll we, agree with that. Because I think the we 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 have not to break the policy. The policy is, of course, not having any romantic relationship with your students. I get and, it. Uh, I get it. I and mean, we didn't even know that it would, it may happen. It just a long time after. It's true. We were already connected as mm-hmm. a good friend, mm-hmm. and also because she she happened to be uh, because Peace Corps has a system of home. Um, how do you call that? Uh, homestay. Homestay. Where you live with yes, the family. Homestay. They live oh, in the village. Yes. Yeah. yes. And she happened to live within my family. So we developed like kind of really she, cool You live with his family? Yes, but yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't living there okay. because I was uh, in the training. Wow. In the training but this city. was before. Th- yeah. In- yeah. So Peace Corps, you, they have uh, field-based training. And so they assign you to live in homes of people in the right. rural areas and mm-hmm. I happened and he we were training in the village where Francois is from and I was hap- I happened to be assigned to his I happened to be assigned to his family and so live with his family and his mother his brother and this love was and meant to be yeah. from the jump <laughs> and at the time I was uh, I was coordinating uh, the, the the homestay uh, section and, okay. the, and also language so you did this on purpose so <laughs> 
Uh, I wasn't the one. Sorry, I, it's, I wasn't the one who assigned her. It was a coincidence because I, my logistician, my mm -hmm. logistician uh, mm -hmm. colleague, mm -hmm. was the one who was assigning basically the most of the the, the volunteers mm -hmm. to families, and it happened to be that way. And um, but here's we, here's the the real thing, and so I know the uh, logistics person. He and I are also good friends, and and so. Peace Corps, they have a very low representation of minorities. Mm -hmm. So I was maybe mm -hmm. one of two uh, non-white volunteers who went to Peace Corps. And so, you know, sometimes in the context of different cultural settings, to, uh, to receive a volunteer who is not white, which mm -hmm. is what the image of America is, right. is perceived as something less than. However... Uh, the logistics person knew Francois's family and knew that they were very open and that they were very open to all people and they didn't have that sort of stigma. Right. So they sent me there because they knew I would be comfortable in that environment. I wouldn't be stigmatized or treated as somehow a lesser volunteer right. than the other families who got the, the white volunteers. And so there was some you know, strategizing behind right. that as well. And right. this, I, I must add that this is... Uh, something that is really common in Africa. You know, people, especially in the rural area, they, they see always, and I think this is one of the problems with colonization mm -hmm. and brainwashing, you mm -hmm. know, people tend to see the Caucasian type as maybe advantageous for them to host. Especially in that setting, they wanted to have more, and because it's some type of cliche or etiquette stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. you know, it's so funny. Like, I always say, um, one of my one thing that I truly believe in is that food is a connector. And so often when I think about food, you know, this involves land and involves like a host of things. So um, this definitely was a connector in this instance, you know, in, in, in some respects. So that thank you for thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. And I was actually going to ask you, Shana, when you came to Cameroon, um, was it? A challenge for you to adjust to the way of, of living there. I mean, thankfully, you were put in a, in, a, in a household where it was a little bit more comfortable and you were invited. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of like the way of life um, and then coming from, you know, the States to um, another country where it's obviously totally, totally sure, different. Sure, sure, what, sure. What was that adjustment like? Yeah, for no, you? it was an adjustment. You know, for example, um, where I was posted, I lived in a cement house very simple I think there was one two three rooms and one was my kitchen and then one was my bedroom and then a common space uh had electricity but it came and went so I had to get used to having um, very unstable electricity uh no running water so I had to familiarize myself with a pit latrine and that was the hardest part wow it was the pit latrine usage that almost took me out but I made it <laughs> I made it through Goodness. and kind of got over that. But in terms of, you know, interacting with the people and the cultural pieces, I seem to kind of assimilate much easier. And I think in, in that respect, being an African-American woman helped me because for the most part, I was perceived to be um, Cameroonian until I opened my mouth. Mm. And then you realize that I was not from there. Mm -hmm. And so that helped me to be able to integrate and observe things in ways that maybe others who looked different couldn't do. So it was more the living. Some of the transportation mm -hmm. things were a little different. They had the concept of the bush taxi for anyone who's traveled in the developing world. And it's kind of where you just cram as many people as you can in the car, you know, to get to where you're going. Yeah. And so that was a little different. But, you know, the cultural pieces, the people were warm, they were welcoming. I like the energy of yeah. Cameroon. People yeah. really um, are energetic behind their, you know, things dealing in the, in the market, the outdoor market, or in greeting. So those pieces worked well mm -hmm. for me. Um, for those who are just tuning in um, to the Edible Activist Podcast, I'm Melissa Jones, and I'm here chatting with Shana and Francois Tiano. Tiayan. Tiayan. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they told me this their last name like 50 million times, and guess who can't get it right? Me. It's a tough okay. one. It's it a is tough a tough one. one. Forgive me. It's with love, with love. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're learning a little bit about their background. They both met in Cameroon. Um, they live a wonderful homestead lifestyle out in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is in Montgomery County, which we're going to learn a little bit more about. Um, but I want, I was nosy. I wanted to know how they met in Cameroon, you know, so <laughs> you were breaking that down. I hope you got served. I did. <laughs> 
friend Francois, who I thought was going to be so shy behind the mic, is proving to be otherwise, and I love it. Oh, you know, by the way, uh, I happened to, when I was after university, I had some interaction with radio, oh. national radio station in Cameroon. You so probably know more than me, because I don't know what no, I'm doing. not really. Uh, I was just presenting some uh, chronicles in environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was um, kind of day-to-day -day things that um, happening in the environment, mm -hmm. the threats and how people can do things to safeguard their environment. Wow, mm -hmm. wow. Um, let's take a really quick break. Um, we're going to come back and I want to talk about some of this empowerment work um, that you did in Cameroon and then we're going to get to the homestead lifestyle here in uh, Maryland. All right, guys, I told you to be back. Melissa Jones, Edible Activist Podcast, here with Shayna and Francois Tiaillon. You got it. I did? Oh, my God! <laughs> I'm going to treat myself to a kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about, I was really intrigued by some of this, um, the... Um, women's empowerment work that you were doing over in Cameroon. You said little did they know, like you were supposed to be over there doing some other stuff yeah. with like land and forestry, but you turned your your attention to something else. And I'm just really interested, like um, why? Sure. So it, it was more girls empowerment. And mm -hmm. so when I was at Florida A&M University, I started a nonprofit geared towards teaching life skills to um, uh, low income minority girls in the housing project where I had a, a little girl that I mentored. And I started just mentoring that one girl, but I saw there was a greater need and I wanted to do so much more. So we brought a program to the community. They met weekly and it gathered all the adolescent girls to teach them fundamental life skills. And so mm -hmm. when I got to Cameroon and I realized farming is hard mm -hmm. and I don't want to do that right now, <laughs> I said, what else can I do? And so I kind of it's hard, really? I didn't know yeah, that. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> hard. Like, it's hard. <laughs> At least in I the know, beginning. Josh and you. <laughs> and, 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 and it was very rudimentary kind of tools yeah. and things and walking like miles to the farm. I said, yeah, what else can you do, Shanna? And so I kind of picked up this program that I had in uh, Tallahassee and brought it to Cameroon and kind of adjusted it because I was in Cameroon is... Uh, it's a bilingual country, mm -hmm. one-fourth English-speaking and three-fourths French-speaking. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. So I was in the French-speaking uh, part of Cameroon, and so I had to make some adjustments for language differences, but then started to, to get support in the community and to offer a space for the girls in the village to have a place just to be children and to learn things about themselves and their bodies and their self-esteem. Mm. And so we did a lot of great things. It was about exposure. I was able to get people back in the U.S. to fund activities, to do field trips with them. Oh, wow. They participated in the National Women's Day Parade. Um, and so it was a great opportunity and something very unique in that space mm -hmm. that was focused you specifically towards girls and just for them just to be girls. Yeah. Yeah, because particularly girls in the um in Cameroon in the village setting they have a lot on them they they go Absolutely. to school they come back they yeah. help their parents they help mm -hmm. with small children and so a lot of them don't have time just to be children and so that was the the idea of helping them allow them to do that but also giving them skills as they grow into womanhood mm. yeah um thank you for sharing that sure and Francois I'm interested in um a lot of the um, land work that you've done in Cameroon and more so from your perspective and the answer is it's pretty prevalent but um some of the what were some of the things that you were really shocked about when you came over here in terms of how we do farming and how we and and how we take care of the land or don't take care of the land here compared to 
back at home where everything obviously was so innate in how you grew and what you knew, uh, what were the, the biggest, um, some of the biggest differences or shockers, mm. I'll say? <laughs> yes, you mean uh, about gardening or farming here? Correct. Because uh, I, I had two hats because I, I was interested in uh, land as a researcher mm-hmm. at first, but... Primarily, I was interested at, um, in land as a farmer or assistant farmer, as I said earlier. I, I think the, um, there are a lot of differences. And uh, the, the, the main difference or the main shock that I, I was facing when I started gardening or when we started to really get interested into it was uh, the, 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 the soil quality. Mm. The soil quality is a clay type. It's very difficult to work and to make it productive, especially if you choose organic farming Mm -hmm. or gardening. So I find, because in in tropical area, I think uh, soil is is less compacted, so it is easier to till and to to grow plants and and one thing that I noticed there was they really have to work hard and amend the soil accordingly, uh, naturally, putting more organic stuff. So we had to do a lot of composting, do a lot of um, using more natural stuff to really uh, enrich the soil. In the beginning, we used some uh, product that we were buying from the, um, from the markets, like uh, leaf grow. But mm-hmm. Ultimately, we are trying, or we are trying to have a more sustainable, more autonomous production of these uh, compost. Mm-hmm. But I think, with after two or three years of learning, uh, navigating through this journey, I think we we have more experience now. Mm-hmm. And I think the soil also that we are, where we are growing our food, is uh, far more better than when we started. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sure. I'm mm-hmm. sure. And I'm sure that's a story for a lot of folks, mm-hmm. too. Um, so when did you all come back to the States? Late 2008. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. okay. And we started in Hampton for a brief period and then oh, okay. transitioned to the D.C. metro area by way of Burke, Virginia, okay. initially, and then landed in Burtonsville and then ultimately Silver Spring. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm familiar with all those areas yeah. as a suburb girl. Um, homesteading in Silver Spring in the county. Define that for us. Define what, tell listeners what you have defined that for yourselves and why you have come to this point of where, you know, this is the lifestyle that I want to live for me and my family. Sure. I'll start. And that's why you complete what I leave out. <laughs> Two's um, better than one. Yeah. <laughs> So our our tagline on our Instagram page is that we're living and eating our values. Mm. And and I think that kind of sums it up. We That's a tweet tweet. You know how Oprah uh, said that's a tweet tweet. A tweet that's tweet. a tweet tweet. <laughs> is that different than a tweet? No, it's no. she that's for Twitter. Oh right. A but, tweet tweet. But a tweet oh I get it. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay, I was lame, but you know, I, I have to oh, say a that. Tweet tweet as in for Twitter. I'm yes. Sorry. I'm I like that though. I'm I like cool that. <laughs> You've been cool. Yeah. So, so that's what homesteading is for us. It's a way to align our lifestyle with our values. I'm very into this idea that you should live your values, not just put them on a shelf. And so we've always mm. been uh, very healthy in the way we eat. You know, even before we started homesteading we've always liked the outdoors and the natural space Mm -hmm. and a lot of this comes from the influence of Francois that's how he grew up you know not a lot of processed foods he has been running for decades and you know taking care of his body so that had a really positive effect on me even though that wasn't my upbringing Mm -hmm. you know my mom was about cooking food good food real food in the home and so I was used to that as a way of life but not to the extent that we're doing now. And so with homesteading, it really is any effort that you want to move towards living a more sustainable life personally, you Mm. know, in terms of activities around the home. For us, that translates into gardening, into food preservation. We, 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 uh, dehydrate. I taught myself how to can this summer. We make a lot Yay. of yeah. That was a, that's another story. But it's just to get a can of something. <laughs> so when Francois just like yeah. collects. <laughs> no, it's 
Very it's useful. a work in progress, but we got something on the shelf. Mm-hmm. So, um, and just living sustainably, trying to have more sustainable agricultural uh, practices, teaching our children about conserving energy. That is and so wonderful. That's the that's how we define homesteading. But it's not an all or nothing thing. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. people don't try to be too sharp with it, and it discourages others. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. I leave out, or they try to be like perfect in every yeah, way with it and yeah, say oh yeah. we're not doing this we're not doing that right and then you probably fall into this guilt trap and maybe you don't feel like you know you're living like you're it's not enjoyable just, yeah right? it's, it's not an, exactly it's exactly exactly did i leave out anything you think yeah i think of? um even if i can add something yes, I, I was please. just saying that um homesteading it encompasses so many things but mm-hmm. i think the um, I insist mostly prim- primarily on the food aspect, the food dimension, mm-hmm. uh, because I think that was uh, the, the origin. The, the, it's to be able, at our own level, to produce uh, about 50-60% of food that we can consume, so to reduce maybe what we purchase. Mm. And, and also um, the ability to, as she said, to, to preserve food transform and process lo- uh, locally and and, and 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 to eat at a later period mm-hmm. right so it um, it's a process of course there are other dimension when you are gardening on your home gardening it's a uh, you control what you're eating mm-hmm. it's also a kind of therapeutic it's uh, yes, it, it, because you know being in contact on a daily basis with nature and the plants and, mm-hmm. uh, and talking to the flowers and, talking to the flower <laughs> and seeing and learning from yeah. from it because I think along the way I think people will say all sort of things you will learn from books you will learn from maybe uh, other co-gardeners but I think the most interesting thing in gardening is that you learn by doing mm-hmm. and being in it yes Just being, being in, in it, it. Mm-hmm. Wow, yep. I love that. Mm-hmm. And you guys, you have four kids that are Yeah, mm-hmm. yep. we have four kids. <laughs> and we I hope, and it. we hope that they will be our main legacy. In that <laughs> we hope so. Yeah, you hope so. I hope so. it's not just wishful thinking. Well, you know what? I, I I said this in my last podcast, and the more that my work starts to involve in this space, this is all spiritual work for me. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot about you know honoring my ancestors and my roots, um, and everything else I can be doing just to honor those who came before me um, in the food space and in different many capacities. Um, So I would love, you know, and food, we've been doing this for years. You know, this is in our blood, you know, our, our ancestors, you know, we're on the land and oftentimes there um, is some, for some folks, trauma associated when we talk about land and farming and stuff like that. And really one of my my hopes for this platform is to call people back to the land Mm -hmm. through these food narratives because it's not just about being out and sweating in the farm, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a host of things. But I would love for you to speak on, you know, honoring our ancestry through this work. You know, it is about living a sustainable life. It is about living a wholesome life. But just honoring the roots that came before us because this is stuff that was being done before like this is not new <laughs> absolutely and Francois's upbringing is an example of that exactly. he continued to grow up very rooted in agriculture homes even homes in urban areas they surround they surround the homes with with gardens yes. small gardens to grow fruit trees or something everyone is cultivating something it's a way of life it's not a big deal and so there was this sort of um, uh, severing of this link, you know, after slavery ended because of a lot of the trauma, like you said, around mm-hmm. it. So once we got, you know, post civil rights, and then people had other options to move north and do different things besides mm-hmm. agriculture, you know, there there wasn't as much interest in the land. And so, you know, I, I get it, and I think for me, I. I I try to go back to what I learned and saw in Cameroon and how the land was still very much um, joyful and meaningful and important and and and, and that's how you, you sort of honor the ancestors by reconnecting with that original that birth right. relationship with the land. Right. 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 You wanna to add to that, Francois? Yes, <laughs> um, I think that um, the, in relation to this ancestor question or honoring our ancestor, I think it, the, one of the best ways to do it is uh, 
to be able to transmit to future generation mm. the land that we inherit from our ancestors on our turf. We, uh, and we, I also think that educating our children is the best way to do it as well. T yes. Teaching them about where the food is coming from, from the land where we live in, we all live in. And, and also teaching them uh, how to make good choices in the food that they are having. Uh, and that the best way, of course, is to produce your own food. If you can, people may say that they are, uh, they, there is a scarcity of land because maybe some, some people, they live in townhouses. Mm -hmm. But we have, at least here in the uh, United States, unlike in, maybe in Africa, we have uh, community gardens that mm -hmm. are spreading almost everywhere. That's mm -hmm. something that I discover in recent years. Wow. Uh, it's very interesting. I think wow. it gives people option yeah. to leave their home and walk. And um, along the way, they're also exercising and, yeah. and go and garden with children, mm -hmm. which is so more instructive and more educational yes. than anything. Than anything. So I think that's mm -hmm. uh, one of the way, the best way to really honor our sister and also help as we use this uh, technical word, um, reduce our footprint on the environment. I yes. think it's the best way. When you, you can grow your own food, when you can control what you're eating, it's obviously, it's a way to reduce your food spring, your environmental food mm -hmm. so. Touche. Mm -hmm. Touche. I love when people are preaching over here. All right, guys, <laughs> we're going to take a quick, quick break. Um, we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. For those who've been tuning in, I'm Melissa Jones of the Edible Activist Podcast here at the Line Hotel, D.C. I'm sitting here with Shana and Francois Tion. But did I get the Shana right or Shanna? I can't get Shana. Uh, Hannah, Shanna. With the, Hannah with the S in front of it. I know. I'm so sorry. With love. All right. We're trying. Ugh. We're learning. We're learning. Yeah. I'm learning everything. Getting to day. know each other. Exactly. <laughs> Shanna. I'm going to get it right. I'm gonna no see problem. You again I'm easy. This, Shanna. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so what does a day look like at the Black Suburban Homestead? I'll let Francois take that because he, he has the title <laughs> Farmer in Chief. So <laughs> that's his, his title. Wow. So go ahead. You, I love um, it. Get your name behind, tag. Behind the scenes. Did you go to Maryland too? Yes, no, no. Not sure. She's oh, no. the one who Oh, okay, okay. I just like Maryland. You just like Maryland. Okay. My sister went to Maryland. Yes. Shout out to her. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Alexia is actually undergrad at Maryland. Shout out. Oh, she's their okay. engineer. Oh, nice. <laughs> no, um, homesteading uh, in our context is, um, is a really a very busy schedule. And you need to, that, that's the part of it. You need to be really available to do it. And mm -hmm. Some people, as uh, we used to say, they are very excited about the idea of gardening, but gardening actually takes time, effort, of and sometimes back breaking uh, activities. But I think it's the good one. It's a good yeah. break, back breaking yeah. activity. I'm going to break it's my a, back. Yes, I guess I'm it's growing good. my own food, it's, right? It's good, I think. <laughs> Is um, uh, basically it's uh, the, it goes from the process of land preparation, composting, and uh, um, s s uh, planting and harvesting, and all this is almost a year all all year round. But you guys are doing this every day, all day. Uh, me especially for now, I'm doing that okay. because uh, after, for example, harvesting. I'm now preparing the soil for fall crops. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm having fall crops, which is more, more predom predominantly veg vegetables mm -hmm. so that are like appropriate for this. Yes, green. And, yes, mm -hmm. green. So it's very busy, and I'm glad that in this parenthesis that I, I have more time than she does. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I am more into the soil and uh, the hands on uh, part of it, and then she she assists me, but she does. Uh, 
the master, the chief in the, the, the chief in processing and uh, and the food preservation the, the food is in chief. <laughs> I want these titles, so, man. <laughs> Can I come so, visit? I want to see. Of course, <laughs> you're more than welcome. <laughs> are the kids involved at all? Yeah. They are to different degrees. It gets They're a little too, sure. a little harder when yeah. school starts and we get back into the programs and and activities and things. But yeah. um, they are. We have four and. Uh, some of them like it more than others, you know. <laughs> some of them like to come and help more than others. I'm not saying any names, but <laughs> <And>. <laughs> you know. But you know, they have an exposure, and the the foundation's kind of been laid for them to to know what it is. And so, you know, Francois does this uh, largely full time, and I do it part time because I have my own uh, uh, consulting business. And so, mm-hmm. but all the food preservation comes through me the, the drying the preservation the vacuum sealing the washing and you know other things that we kind of do related to it yeah i am like a little kid over here because i i just i haven't i haven't even been to your place but you're like living this dream that <laughs> <laughs> well you know i'm kind of stuck in the middle right like i i, I like the city life but I'm like, give me a, give me some space, some land. Let me do my thing. But I think this is so great because I love that you're defining this. I love that you're you're sharing like what this lifestyle lifestyle means to you, and that this this isn't for just any one particular person, Absolutely. and it isn't just for a white population, you know, or it isn't just for a, an Asian pop. You like mm-hmm. this, like as black people, like we again, again, we have. This is in our blood, in our DNA. Mm-hmm. We're just going back to what our ancestors, right. you know, and our aunts and our grandmothers and our great great grand like what they were already doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but like this is a lifestyle that we can like. This is an option, you Absolutely. know. It might not be for everyone, like you said, but I just think that you guys are really great examples that you know our people of color we can live this way. And there are many Absolutely. options to it as well, like because so you, so you have like. Most people, when they think the conception of homesteaders, they think people who are in this rural area with, like, the next neighbor three miles away. <laughs> and when we were buying a home, I can do rural. Mm-hmm. Francois doesn't want to do rural. He wants to be close to stuff and amenities right. and things like that. So he's like, I'm you not going. You want to be able to run to the store if you right. need to. <laughs> so you're not going to put me in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so here we are in the middle of suburbia with an HOA, you know. Wow navigating this homestead space where we're not in the urban area we're not in dc or um, baltimore so there are many different environments that you can decide how you want to kind of embrace this homesteading like there's no rubric or, or model that everyone has to to mm-hmm. to follow i mean you can be in an apartment with a patio absolutely and stuff doing your thing right absolutely and it's about sustainable living yes. and you know we started making our own cleaning products recently wow. this summer and a long maybe like three years ago we got rid of paper napkins and paper towels and did oh, um wow. cloth napkins. You do all cloth napkins. Yeah. So if I go into your bathroom, you have like a, a little thing of like cloth napkins. Well, we have a towel hanging. Oh, out you have on a towel. Okay, okay, a towel. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, we're not quite that fancy. Okay. Yet, okay. No, that's okay. That's okay. I aim to yeah. get there. I mean, I have a towel in my bathroom, but you know, I. That's awesome. Yeah. So everyone can figure out what piece of this life they want and and claim it for their own. Where can everyone find you guys at on social media? Are you just on on Instagram or are you on yep. Facebook, Twitter at all? Just on Instagram okay. at Black Suburban Homestead, and okay. I cross I share um, the Instagram post on my personal page, Shanna B T I on on Facebook. But that's where we are right now. Okay, so uh, we're gonna wrap up in just a few moments, and we're gonna get into like our rapid fire, just a fun way to conclude the show. I'm gonna ask you a couple questions, but. Um, what what is the the a legacy that you all want to leave behind? I actually often find myself asking everyone this question because I think that's really important, um, especially for you know a, a family of it's four six of y'all mm-hmm. yeah, six. <laughs> in total, you six. know, um, and and I, and I like that you embrace the fact that you know some of my kids they're into it, some of them aren't, mm-hmm. and that's okay. But you know, I'm sure there's still some things that you want to instill in them and maybe other people who are around in your community. Um, you know, from your years down the road, like what does that look like, and what are you trying to instill in your community and your family or those connected in your circle? Yeah, I, as you mentioned, almost until somehow I think educating and making sure that the children they are really uh, 
integrating these values, this homesteading lifestyle in their day-to-day life, mm-hmm. it will be really rewarding mm-hmm. for me if I see them really taking over. Because we do all these things, we're going to, we're going to leave all this yeah. and hope that they can continue. Mm-hmm. So it would be a really um, a, a great pleasure for me to see that they can continue that. And I think and um, also getting involved in uh, advocacy uh, awareness activity it would be uh, very you know, interesting in the sense that uh, you try to help um, uh, other people to uh, emulate, to, to, to copy what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So I would, be, um, I would be glad if I can have more uh, activity. And we are doing, uh, and I think especially Shana is uh, with uh, what she's doing in Facebook and Instagram is a way to to spread what we're doing, educating other people mm-hmm. and sharing I mean, all the information. You guys, are, are, you guys got survival survival skills as far as I'm concerned. If stuff goes down, y'all are good. I'm the one that's you over here like going to be too. running to the homestead. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you see this little girl running? <laughs> that's me. That is me. Did you want to add to that at all? No, I think... Shanna, I got it right. You Shanna. did. Yay, <laughs> right at the end. Um, no, I, I think first of all, I said it well. It's just to to leave a legacy and, and that the work we do matters and education and just being an example of the expansiveness and the accessibility of this space mm-hmm. for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys again for being on my show. This wow. was an honor. It's always like never enough time. Yeah, time flew. It, wow. yeah, it feels like five what? minutes, you know, it's That's so much crazy. to pack in, but um, it was an honor to meet you all. Um, I love meeting folks I've never met before and just learning about your story and your journey. And I'm excited about the involvement of, you know, the work that you guys have been doing in this lifestyle. I love it's a lifestyle. So keep up the great work. I hope I'm invited. Absolutely. Anytime. Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> do you cook, Francois? Yes, I do. But okay. She, she's, she does she's the, the most. This is the master chef yeah. over here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Food I'm preservationist slash cook in chief. <laughs> Slash mom, we gotta slash, get you some t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> t-shirt wouldn't be big enough for my title. <laughs> we'll just be small print. Yeah. Like, just a whole like biography of everything. All right. So you know what? So how we can? Okay. So I'm gonna ask a question, right? And I'll give each of you. So you're, you'll answer, or whoever wants to go first, right? So we're, this is what I call like our rapid fire. So it's just like a, some um, questions just to learn about what you like, what you don't like. Um, and so, what is your favorite leafy green? Broccoli. Leafy. <laughs> <laughs> like a like a spinach, kale, collars. We eat a lot of I'll kale. I'll take broccoli. Broccoli. I th- um, and to some extent, kale. 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 Yeah. Broccoli. Kale. Okay. We like kale. And a fun thing we did, we made, we dehydrated kale, made a green powder, which is great. We're loving that. So what do you use the kale. powder for? Almost. Anything. Smoothies, you sneaking in, in muffins for the kids. And especially, you know, children, sometimes they don't want to eat this vegetable, which are really so important for them. So you can right on there. <laughs> <laughs> you can eat. Yep. I love it. Mm. Yes. Oh, you don't want them greens? <laughs> That's okay. Shake it on. Shake it on. Mm. You don't have to have those greens. I like it. I like it. Um, an edible activist you look up to? Uh, I would say uh, I uh, look up to uh, a French, mostly a French activist. Uh, it's called uh, Pierre Slamish. It's uh, actually the um, director and co-founder of uh, Open Fact. Open fact food. Open fact food. Oh, I got to look into that. Yeah, which is very interesting because I think it's a uh, it's sort of a Wikipedia for food. Okay. Really? Uh, yes, it gives uh, the consumer the ability to choose the quality to the quality of food that they are eating. Wow. To get the information, know where, and I think there are a lot of activities or a lot of association around the world that are now in getting involved in this type of. Uh, Movement, and I think this is very interesting because I know we often buy and the um, the, the items and the the, the, the writings on, mm-hmm. on on product that we are buying in the supermarket are very difficult to really yes. So I think uh, this is a good uh, thing. It's uh, give uh, the consumer to, to to be in the know. Mm. To and we all know no, knowledge is power. That. Wow, you're mm-hmm. right about that, and I learned. See, I, I didn't know about that, mm-hmm. and I learn every time. So, mm-hmm. Shana, what about you? I think all the moms out there are trying to put a decent meal on, a, on the table to the moms. without all the resources and support that they need. You're right. Yeah, that's 
You're a right. heavy work that is often overlooked and it happens every day. You are so right yeah. about that. Shout out to the moms. Mm-hmm. Um, sweet, spicy, sour, or salty? Oh, definitely spicy. <laughs> I don't even know how people can have food without spice. Because life is nothing spice. without spice. You need right. some spice in tweet, life. Tweet. Spice life. <laughs> Shana? I like spicy sweet. Spicy sweet? Yeah. Okay. We made a kicking jalapeno jam. I'm coming that over. Was Stop. Fantastic. Stop. So definitely the spicy sweet. Oh my gosh. That's my spice. Anytime you need someone to like come in and like help, t- you know, taste and be like a, I'm, I'm, I'm available. Okay. Careful what you Just say now. Me. Not everything comes out good the first time. That's okay. <laughs> I won't judge you. I won't judge you. Favorite fruit? Oh, watermelon for me. Hmm. Love, um, I like watermelon too. I guess apples. Yeah, put just some, I had one today. Just some apples. They're so versatile. You can put them in they oatmeal, are. pies, eat them like that, salads. I like apples. Yeah. A good crispy apple, not a, a good, mushy. Yeah, one. not a mushy. Mm-hmm. You better get a crispy one. Yeah. I don't do no mushy I apples. I hate mushy apples. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that would that just hurts ruin my, my day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does. Like, I'll be so disappointed. <laughs> You are hilarious. So let's leave the, um, the the listeners with one way that anyone can be channeling their edible activism, whether it's homesteading, whether it's growing, whether it's just being conscientious. Um, what, what would that one thing be for anybody? Sustainability. Focus on being sustainable in your life. And if that's the core goal, then it kind of impacts everything. Where you buy your food, what you eat, what you do, how you consume things. So I, th- I think sustainability, being more sustainable or having that as an intention mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that you use as the basis for other decisions for your life. Spot on. Yeah, I would add to that just because sometimes it's a large spectrum. And, and I think it's good for people just to have one thing that you can choose in what Shana mentioned. Mm-hmm. If you can only choose one and start from there, you will, be, you will make a difference mm-hmm. in terms of uh, impacting positively the environment. And not trying to tackle every single mm-hmm. thing, but just mm-hmm. focus on one. That's yes. so true. Like homesteading, for example. Yeah. Like choosing what you're buying. Um, quality of food that you're consuming and then everything else will just yep. evolve yep you know yeah sounds good to me all right thanks everyone for tuning in we're here live on full service radio every wednesday at 11 a.m and you can access each episode after it airs at full service and we're on itunes all right the edible activist podcast on itunes um be sure to follow me at food talks dc on instagram facebook and twitter are you an edible activist if so come join me on this show i would love to feature you send me a dm on instagram or you can email me at melissa at goodsoulevents.com Thanks and have a wonderful day. Shanna and Francois, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this program on Full Service Radio, broadcasting and recording from the Line Hotel in Adams Morgan, Washington, D.C. Full Service Radio programming can be accessed live and archived on fullserviceradio.org. Our talk programming is available on most podcast apps like iTunes and Stitcher. And our DJ sets are available on Mixcloud.com slash Full Service Radio. Full Service Radio features over 30 weekly shows and over 50 local hosts covering every topic imaginable. If you want to be a guest or get involved, email us at info at fullserviceradio.org. Follow us on Twitter at Full Service RDO, on Instagram and Facebook at Full Service Radio. Thanks for listening.